Okay, so thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to tell you a story of work that we have been doing in my group for quite a few years now. Um, I hope to tell you two stories if I have time. They're all connected. Uh, they're connected by uh, the materials that we use and the techniques that we use. Um, let me say at the outset that everything I tell you about is not my work, but work of people who've been in my group. Um, most of what I'll tell you about is the work of Anderson Shum, who was a graduate student of the group, is now a professor in Hong Kong. Um, and the, the other half, if I get to it, is the work primarily of Jeremy Agresti, a postdoc in the group who now works for BioRAD. But the work I'll tell you about um, has uh, contributions from many people, uh, many of whom are listed here, but really it's been a large number of people. The theme of all of the work is using microfluidics, and I'd like to show you how we do that to try and do several different things. If I have time, what I'd like to try and tell you is how we make materials, new materials, new soft materials out of microflu using microfluidics as a way of uh, formulating, of constructing them. And secondly, how we use microfluidics for what's the more traditional uh, thing, and that's to do um, lab on a chip applications. So the most important application of microfluidics is to do lab on a chip. That's going to be the last third of what I'll tell you about. Another application of microfluidics is to try to make new materials. And uh, I can say at the outset that I know many uh, large companies uh, investigated this, uh, say, about 10 years ago, 10 to 7 to 10 years ago, and came to the conclusion that while you can make interesting materials, uh, you will never make them in practical quantities. So it's impossible, and they closed down the effort. And so, of course, when I realized that, I thought that was the perfect topic for research for Harvard students. So that's something that we focused on. So what I'm going to try and do is convince you that we can make interesting materials using microfluidics and that we can do it in a practical way. Uh, this is something that most people will not uh, necessarily agree with. I'd like to try and convince you that we do. Um, and then the other thing I'll try and tell you about is how we use the microfluidics for more uh, of the so-called lab on a chip applications. So um, when I was a student, when I studied chemistry, if we wanted to manipulate fluids, we used pipettes. Anybody remember that? No, you better not, because that's not what you're supposed to do, right? You, you use now these fancy pipettes, uh, and these things, you know, it takes you a few seconds to manipulate milliliters to hundreds of microliters, maybe tens of microliters of fluids. Um, this was, well, we do this in the lab a lot, but if you really want to do a lot of things, uh, you uh, use a robot, you use a machine that essentially does the same thing. And this speeds it up by uh, quite a bit. Instead of doing it, you know, 10 of these a minute, maybe you do several hundred a minute. Um, instead of using, typically we use milliliters here, you might use microliters. And you use these uh, plates of, uh, to, to uh, sort everything and to, to keep control of it. This is the way, sort of, this is not the, the latest generation, but this is the way you manipulate fluids now if you want to do a lot of things. Um, but this is, there's been a revolution in this, and that's driven by microfluidics. That's basically a way of manipulating fluids at very small volumes and relatively high rates. And here's a picture of a microfluidic chip that manipulates things. It does essentially the same thing as that robot does. This is something that was designed by Steve Quake, who's now at uh, Stanford. Um, it's commercialized. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, technology. This is a few years old. It's much more advanced now. Um, but this is the way uh, things are moving. This will manipulate nanoliters of fluid as opposed to microliters of fluid, so three orders of magnitude better. What I want to tell you about is how to use microfluidic devices for these kinds of applications. And I will come back to those specific applications. But what my whole theme is with the microfluidics, what you're doing is you're designing in the same way that you 
why it's called this, the, the, the terminology, the analogy as to how you control electrons with wires. Here you're c controlling fluids by etching channels into some kind of device. But what you're really doing is you're uh, mixing and controlling the flow of fluids at the scale of the structures that you're interested in making. And that's the key. That's the, all, the, the only thing that I think that we do with microfluidics. Everything is very controlled because you make things, you mix them at a scale, at a different scale. And I know this is a center for nanoscience, but you typically work with micron size uh, fluid uh, drops or, or structures in, uh, with microfluidics. That's why it's not called nanofluid, it's called microfluidics. Uh, the reason actually is fairly simple. There's nothing that prevents you from going to the nanoscale except for one very practical concern. A piece of dust is five microns. And if you don't want to filter like mad and work in a clean room, if you want to just do something quick and dirty, literally dirty, you work at scales a little larger than dust, so a little larger than five microns, say 10 microns, you never have to worry about dust. It's really as simple as that. So um, as I showed you, lab on a chip applications are very important. I'd like to come back to that um, in the second part of the talk. Um, what I want to talk about first is actually synthesis. Using the fact that we can uh, mix and control the flow of fluids with exquisite precision to make new kinds of things, new kinds of structures. Everything that we do is based on uh, using immiscible fluids, using two fluids one of which is immiscible in a second, so we're making a drop of one fluid in a second. And the real reason, or the, 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 the most important reason that you start with a drop is that you can encapsulate one fluid in a second. Uh, a simple example is, a, a very good example of drops of one fluid in a second is milk. Why is milk white? 2% milk is white because there's 2% flat fat drops little drops, micron-sized drops of fat, which is a liquid, in the water. So it's drops of one fluid, they encapsulate the, the fat inside of the water. That's the standard use of drops. But you can also use the drop, because of its surface tension, you can use it as a template. And that's what I want to describe today, how you can use the drop as a template on which you can, can construct more complicated structures. And you can fabricate new materials, and you can do all of this with this exquisite precision of uh, using microfluidic devices. So, drops like milk, what is that? A collection of drops is nothing more than an emulsion. So, Anderson did, did a nice little schematic of how you make an emulsion. A uh, very common emulsion is salad dressing. So, you go to the store and you buy creamy Italian, that's an emulsion. But this is the North America, everything is pre-made, it's all creamy, it's all stable emulsion. You go to, to France and you use, get, you, you use a vinaigrette, oil and vinegar. Oil and vinegar, and the way you make an emulsion is you shake. So he shook this up, and this is what you ended up, end up with. Drops of one fluid in a second, usually the, the uh, higher volume fraction fluid is the, is the continuous phase, but they're all different sizes and all different shapes. And the reason they're all different sizes and shapes is because you've just used energy, you've shaken it. You have no control over the size. What I want to show you about is how to make absolutely perfectly monodispersed, absolutely uniform drops that look like this. I'm not going to talk, at least initially, about the traditional kinds of microfluidics where you make you use technology, say, the semiconductor technology of 30 or 40 years ago to make chips. I'll tell you something about it, that at the end. Initially, I want to tell you about a much simpler kind of geometry, a much simpler kind of way of making drops, of using microfluidic devices that we developed because we needed something that's very robust for different kinds of chemicals, something that we can control the wettability in a very uh, simple fashion, and something that has a three-dimensional character because usually the, the more traditional things have a more two-dimensional character. So we used capillary tubes. We made our own kind of a microfluidic device based, based on capillary tubes. These are very common if you go to your biology friends. People who do patch clamping use these all the time. Um, so we start with literally a capillary tube, a one 
millimeter, uh, uh, one millimeter in diameter capillary tube, and it's glass, so what you can do is you can heat the middle of it to very close to the glass transition, and you can pull it like this, and it'll snap, and you end up with a very small orifice, and you can control this very precisely, this is a machine that does this, and you can control it very precisely, very reproducibly, you can easily make an orifice that's a micron in diameter, we typically work more 10 or 20 microns in diameter. But this is a very easy way to make a structure. Then we want to align it, so we use a bit of a trick. Uh, the trick is actually based on a toy, the idea came from a toy that at least I had when I was a kid, I don't know if you are uh, kids or you had them when you were kids, depending whether you have kids or you're still a kid. The, kid, the toy that I had was a block of wood and there were different shapes that were cut into the block of wood, and there were uh, blocks that fit in the shape. There's a round one, a triangle one, a square one. Do you remember those toys? Yeah, you remember them. So I used to always figure out which one you could, could place into that. And of course, you know, you never could put the round uh, block into the square hole. It didn't fit. But if you have a square hole and you have a round plug that's exactly the same diameter, the outer diameter of the round plug is exactly the same dimension as the inner diameter of the square, you can still fit it in. Moreover, if it's pretty precise and you have a long cylindrical tube, you can align it just by putting it against one of the corners. You can align it very simply. So now you have a very simple way of aligning things. In addition, since this is the round, uh, the, the, the cylindrical a uh, capillary tube that's drawn down to a very narrow orifice, this is really highly blocked and fluid flowing here is going to have this large resistance. So you can flow fluid through these four uh, corners here and you can get quite enough flow to have a uniform flow of the two, ty two types of fluid. So you can have two fluids flowing in the same direction. So you take this, here's the uh, square capillary, the a cylindrical capillary, you put them together into a device, this is what it looks like. Remember, what I told you is everything we do in my lab, we like to do things very simply so we can try lots of things, so it's all held together with our favorite material, five minute epoxy. A device like this, um, Anderson, a very good student, could build a device like this very easily in half an hour. Um, so we can make something like this that looks like this, this is what it looks like in the lab, we have various types of pumps, we look at it with the microscope, cameras and everything. I'm going to show you a lot of images, they're all taken with a microscope, and they're taken with a camera that's usually a high speed camera and everything's slowed down. So here's an example, this is that same device, the continuous phase is flowing here, it's coming from the four corners which are way off here, this is seen through a microscope, so this is about 20 microns, 10 microns in diameter, this orifice, this has been pulled down, you can't see the rest of it because we're looking in the microscope, and we're making drops. The drops are very uniform in size, uh, they're being made, it looks like they're being made at one or two per second, but in fact they're made at several thousands per second, they're made at several thousand per second because I've slowed everything down. So a typical rule of thumb for the production rate of these drops is one to ten kilohertz, one to ten thousand per second. So this looks, this should remind you of something, this should remind you of something that reminds you of dripping, like something that's coming out like a drip at a time, a drop at a time. If you increase the flow rate of the inner fluid, then you form a jet. So this we call jetting. This is not quite the same, and to show you the difference, I'm going to try and hold my laser pointer exactly where the drops are being formed. So they're being formed here, but notice, my laser is reasonably steady, but it doesn't always point to where they're being formed. So they're not quite as uniform when you get this jetting phenomenon. Actually, the difference between dripping and jetting is something that you're familiar with. You can do an experiment and see it yourself. Just go home to your toilet or to your bathroom or to your kitchen, to some faucet in the lab, and turn it on very slowly, and you can get something that goes drip, 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 drip. Then turn it on a little faster, you get a jet, you get a stream of a fluid, you get a stream, but if you get the, if you adjust this just right, you'll see that it always breaks up into drops right at the end. You have to adjust it so it doesn't go too fast, so it breaks up into drops. But if you don't believe that it always break, break, breaks up into drop, drops, take something that really flows fast, like a fire hose. 
and take that and spray it, but spray it as far as you can. You'll see always at the other end, you form drops. You always break it up into drops. And this is an instability, it's called the Rayleigh Plateau instability. We can understand the physics of this instability. In fact, we can understand the physics of, of everything with a very, very simple analogy, with a very simple dimensional argument. So if you're forming drops in this dripping case, what happens is you're slowly flow, flowing the fluid, the water in this case, and it's being held by surface tension at the uh, at the interface. And at first, the forces, the surface tension forces are enough to hold the drop in place. It doesn't fall. But as it grows, it gets larger, it gets heavier, until finally it balances, the surface tension forces balance the gravitational forces. And if this is clean, then it's always the same. It breaks off and it forms a drop. This always happens exactly the same place if it's clean. So the drops are very uniform in size. The jetting, when you get the, uh, the drops formed to, uh, for a jet, the, it's, it's simply this Rayleigh uh, plateau instability and says nothing more that I can reduce the surface area and hence the surface energy of something that's a cylinder by breaking it into spheres. So if you make spheres, that's the, uh, uh, the, smallest, uh, the, the, the smallest surface area for any shape is a sphere, so you just basically decrease the total surface area, so you lower the energy of the system. We can understand how this forms in a very simple fashion. If this is a cylinder of fluid, imagine that there's some instability where you get a small narrowing here. Remember, there's a Laplace pressure. There's a pressure inside that's inversely proportional to the curvature. So there's a curvature here. The radius of curvature here is the full radius of the uh, of the cylinder, but here it's slight, slightly less, so the Laplace pressure is slightly higher here. This pressure being higher than here drives the fluid this direction and this direction, so it's actually unstable. It pushes the fluid away and it breaks off. It, the velocity that it moves in this direction is just given from dimensional uh, uh, terms by the balance of the surface energy which is driving it and the viscosity of the fluid which is resisting it. The ratio of these is a the velocity, so the time it takes for snap off is just the time it takes to move this dimension. So it takes this, uh, this radius divided by the velocity. That gives you the time it takes for snap off. If, uh, if, if this is moving, with some velocity now, so there, there's the instability, if it's moving with some velocity, then I know what the snap-off time is and I know what the velocity is so I can calculate the length of this jet. It's just how long it takes for it to snap off, how, how far it moves downstream. So now I can easily calculate the transition between jetting and dripping. I just set the length of the jet to be the radius of the drop and if I do that, I find, whoops, I find that it's the capillary number, this ratio of viscosity, velocity, and surface tension, when that's of order one, that's the transition. That's what, 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 what transitions between dripping and jetting. There's actually a second kind of instability that forms when the velocity of the inner fluid is very rapid very high, then it's more of an inertial effect. It depends on a Weber number, it depends on a ratio of inertia and uh, capillary forces. It's a very interesting transition. If you watch in particular this, watch the interface, you're going to see a real uh, traditional instability. You're going to start seeing uh, fluctuations that grow exponentially. It's just an instability. So the same drop formation. In fact, you can combine everything. You can see where the capillary number is order one and the Weber number is order one. You just sum the two and this is the boundary between dripping and jetting. So we can understand what's causing the different kinds of formation that we see. It's a very interesting physical phenomenon. It just depends on hydrodynamic instabilities. There's no excess energy. You're not putting extra energy in. You're just using natural instabilities of the fluid flow to create drops. So this is a very low energy way of creating drops. <clears throat> um, you can control this, you know where it is, so now we can start doing something with, with this. I showed you how you can make emulsions, but now let me show you by taking advantage of this knowledge and taking advantage of what you can do with these very simple kinds of devices, let me show you what else you can, uh, you can make. So first of all, I showed you this case where you have this 
co-flow geometry where the two fluids are flowing in the same direction and really in this case it's not gravity but it's the viscous drag of the outer fluid that plays the role of gravity. Everything else is the same for the stripping and jetting. I can change the geometry by just flowing the inner fluid in in the opposite direction and now collect everything through the orifice so the outer fluid is hydrodynamically focusing the inner fluid. That makes a narrower uh, stream here and actually makes smaller drop sizes for a given orifice. So here's an example. Here the continuous phase, the outer phase is actually coming way around here and looping around here. The inner phase is coming here. We're collecting everything through the orifice and we're making drops. We can do the same thing. We can make a jet. You can't really see the orifice here because it's index matched so well, but there's a little piece of dust here where you should see where it is. But now you can make, so you can get dripping and jetting. But what's interesting, this is this uh, flow focusing geometry, hydrodynamic flow focusing. But look, there's a lot of space here. So let's just add a second capillary tube, which we can align very easily and very precisely. And now we have three fluids. We have a co-flow geometry, which gives you a coaxial flow that's hydrodynamically flow focused by the third fluid. So now you have three fluids. This works. One, two, put them together. This is a microscope image. You see how easy it is to align. And this is what it looks like. This is a device in the movie that Anderson made. And now you see you're getting drops inside of drops. So you're getting multiple emulsions. You're getting drops inside of one drop. You can see that this drop, the inner one, is formed by uh, dripping, whereas the outer one, in this case, is formed by jetting. You have a small jet. And this is widening, so the velocity is decreasing. So right where the capillary number goes to one, that's where you get the snap off. It's, this is perhaps better better seen by just changing the flow rates and now you can get these multiple emulsions with a variety of different sizes, basically different si uh, ratios of the core, the inner drop to the outer drop, just by changing the flow rates. So how would you normally, you know, these are just multiple emulsions, drops inside of drops. These are made very commonly. How do you normally make them? Well, what you do is you do what, what, what Anderson showed you did in the first case. You emulsify something with one shaking, and then you take that same emulsion and emulsify it a second time. And this is a typical multiple emulsion that you get by shaking, where the innermost drops have been fluorescently labeled so we can see them. And you see how it's very irregular. Basically, you're taking the polydispersity that you begin with and you're doubling it, or you're squaring it. Because some drops have a lot of inner drops, some drops have none. There's nothing very controlled. Here we have perfect control over it just by controlling the flow weight. But in addition, we can do something very useful and practical. And let me show you what I mean. Imagine I make this double emulsion, this core shell structure. Imagine the inner uh, core is water and the outermost fluid is also water. And as the shell, I use some kind of solvent. And in the solvent, I dissolve some surface active molecules. I could use a surfactant, I could use a phospholipid, I could use a dye block copolymer. Something that is um, amphiphilic, something that goes to the interface. When I make this structure, this interface and this interface will be coated with these amplophiles. Then, if the uh, solvent is volatile, I can evaporate it. And I can end up with essentially a bilayer structure of a surfactant or a phospholipid. What's the bilayer structure of a phospholipid? It's a vesicle. A bilayer structure of uh, diblock copolymer is a polymerosome. These are very useful structures for encapsulating things. But what's interesting here is that this stream and this stream are completely separate. So if you want to encapsulate some very valuable molecule, you can do it with 100% efficiency because they're a different stream. Normally, if you want to use something like a vesicle to encapsulate things, what you do is you make a multi-layer uh, of dried uh, phospholipids and you put water and whatever you want to encapsulate on top. You bubble ni um, a nitrogen and you self-assemble these uh, uh, bilayer structures. You self-assemble them, you encapsulate what's on the inside, but you also have this very valuable material everywhere, so it's very difficult to get efficient filling. Here you can do it with very high efficiency. So here's an example. These are made with uh, dye block uh, copolymers. So these are polymerosomes. Uh, these uh, we uh, encapsulated a, um, uh, a dye molecule. 
you can see that the dye molecule will stay. This is looking fluorescence. You can come back many days later, many months later. It's uh, um, uh, always encapsulated. And <coughs> these are the uh, uh, structures. They're made with a completely biocompatible uh, molecule. So these would, could be used for various um, uh, biological applications. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, it's actually interesting to actually watch how the evaporation occurs to get rid of the solvent. Here's an image, a series of images of what's happening. You see what's happening is this is the drop of solvent and this is the bilayer structure. There's a contact angle, so there's a de-wetting uh, phenomenon. There's actually a de-wetting from the surface and you can analyze this. It uh, depends on the wetting and the fact that there's contact angle means that there's actually an adhesion between the two layers, between the two bilayers. And in fact, if you measure the contact angle and ask where do you get the most stable structures, you get the most stable structures when the contact angle is as large as it can be, which is 90 degrees, which means that the two surfaces are as adhesive as possible. And in fact, the fact that they're slightly adhesive means that although they're flexible, they're actually solid. And you can see that by trying to crush them. You can crush them by putting an osmotic pressure, basically putting a pressure that tries to draw the water out. If you do that, this is what you see. You see how they're being crushed. They're, being, uh, they're buckling. They're solid, but they're buckling. Only a solid material can buckle. So you know that this is solid. In fact, because you can measure the pressure that you're using to crush them, you can calculate the number that are crushed as a function of pressure, and from this you can calculate the elastic energy. You know what the elastic energy of the solid is. It follows exactly the theory for a thin shell of a material. But crushing them actually has a practical use. So here's some, a series of images where I'm using an osmotic pressure to squeeze them, and I crush them. If I wait long enough, they become completely crushed. So anything that's inside them, except for the very, very largest molecules, anything that's inside them is driven out. So I've just showed you how to encapsulate something and also how to release it. There's actually another way of releasing it, and that's by putting them in osmotic shock, putting them in a very low osmotic pressure and using the osmotic pressure inside to drive the material out. This is what we did here where we used the osmotic pressure of the dye inside the dye molecules by just putting them into pure water and a little hole developed, and if I come back later, I would show you a fluorescent image, but I can't because all the fluorescence has been uh, washed away. The dye molecules have escaped. It's actually interesting to watch what happens. Here's a, uh, some images of uh, these polymerosomes that are being put into a uh, uh, osmotic shock. Notice how they get larger because the water is su being sucked in by the osmotic pressure, and then the hole develops and they shrink. In this case, this one will get larger, then shrink, and will completely shrink away. So this is a second way of releasing things. You can make a lot of other structures. You can make these foams of polymerosomes just by putting lots of drops in and, um, and drying them. You can make solid shells. You don't have to evaporate the solvent. You can polymerize it. This is a uh, shell made with a UV curable resin. And you know that it's solid because the only way to break these is actually to crush them between two glass slides. You get these um, uh, Pac-Man-like shapes. Uh, you can make the shells out of liquid crystal. Here we're using a pneumatic liquid crystal. We're diluting it in chloroform to make it isotropic. We're making a shell and then we're evaporating the chloroform and looking through cross polars and you see that, it's an, uh, that um, a pneumatic liquid crystal is formed. Uh, the reason for doing this was that one of my colleagues, or several of my colleagues, made predictions of the type of defect structure you would see. They predicted you see a baseball structure with four defects. In fact, you do see four defects, but they're not surrounded in a triangular or tetrahedral shape, but they're all collected at the top. Uh, so this was uh, inspired by my colleague David Nelson, and Alberto um, tried to do some experiments. He looked, he found these four defects that David predicted, but he also found a case where two defects and another case with even three defects. And so he could go back to David and there was a nice interplay between the theory and the experiment to try and explain these. It just depends on the nature of the defect structure and the thickness of the shell. Gravitational effects uh, play, a, uh, play an important role. Okay, I showed you how you make uh, double emulsions, but we don't really have to stop there. 
So Yang Yin came to visit our lab uh, from Sichuan University, and he designed a slightly different device. He designed a device, rather than simultaneously making these uh, multiple emulsions, he made them in two steps. This is a co-flow. He co collected them into a second tube and emulsified them uh, with a second co-flow geometry. So here's the emulsions coming from this one, and I'll actually play this movie for a while. The first one comes. It actually took a while for the first one. I've watched this many times, so I know the next one, it'll actually take a uh, fairly long time for it to come. Let me just play it till it comes. Here it is. The third one will come a little faster. Here comes the third. Come on. Here it is. And then it snaps off. And now, just by controlling the geometry, you can really make designer emulsions. You can control both the size and the number very easily. So now, if you say you want five drops on the inside, I can ask you, well, how big do you want the five drops? Because you can control both. You can control them independently because you're controlling the flow. But what's more interesting is, look, one, two, what about here? Let's just add a third. And now you can make triple emulsions. Really easily, you just add one more thing. You remember how we had to make them by uh, shaking them, how ugly they look when you make double emulsions? Imagine making, well, you never make triple emulsions like that. But here it's really easy. You can make absolutely perfectly controlled. You can design whatever you want. In fact, you look at this and you say, this is absolutely an academic exercise. Why in God's name would you ever want to do something like this? Well, look. First of all, Yang Yin, when he went back, he designed things where he could mix different materials. He made a more complicated thing. But he also made this structure. This is a, an emulsion. This is a water and oil emulsion. Imagine the water containing some very um, delicate enzymes. It's in an oil continuous phase. Let's say it's a cream that you want to put on, on your hands or on your face. And the cream then is oil-based, but it has a lot of surfactants and other materials to make the cream uh, uh, spread properly. If the enzymes ever came in contact with that, they would immediately denature. But now they're completely project protected because we use this ability to make this multiple uh, emulsion structure to make a hydrogel that completely coats them. In fact, this hydrogel is thermoresponsive. If you heat it, it shrinks. So look what happens when you heat it up. It starts to shrink. It can't shrink the water, it's incompressible, so it drives the water out and then it tears itself apart and releases it. So now here's a way of making something that's an absolutely robust encapsulation structure but has completely controllable release. And the thing about encapsulation and release, it's very easy to make a structure that's very, very robust at encapsulation, but then it's very difficult to release it. And it's very easy to make something that it releases very easily, but those typically don't robustly encapsulate. Now you have enough control that with your imagination, you can do both. And this is an example. Xin Yun came along and uh, he uh, wanted to make similar structures, but he wanted to go back to the simultaneously emulsification. So he wanted to make a triple emulsion uh, just using this uh, simultaneous effect. So what he did was he used the ability to coat, to surface coat, the surface treat the uh, the um, 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 surface of the, of the capillaries, and he made this one hydrophobic so he could run a very thin stream of oil around here, and now he could make a triple emulsion all in one step. Here's an example of this. You can see that these are triple emulsions, but what's really important is that the outermost shell is very, very thin. In fact, you can't measure the thickness except by breaking it and measuring the volume. You can make uh, shells that are easily uh, well under a micron thick. You might think that these are unstable, but it turns out that lubrication forces make them very, very stable. So here's a series of different triple emulsions. In fact, by uh, coating more uh, surfaces, he could make even a quadruple emulsion, all with a simultaneous emulsification. And we use things like this. Here's an example. This Ali Abbas Purad uh, is a structure that he made where this is a solid shell. It's very thin. It's a plastic shell, but it's liquefied when it comes in contact with oil. So this is a way of making a structure that when it comes in contact with oil, releases and drives out the internal structure. Uh, Laura does the same thing and makes it with phospholipids. This is a very good way of making a vesicle structure. So this is actually a very thin shell which she then can evaporate and leave uh, a phospholipid or a vesicle structure. These are usually very difficult to make because they're very delicate. 
But using these very thin shells, it becomes very easy to make. And here's some examples of them. These are very large uh, 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 bilayer structures, uh, vesicle structures, and they're so large you can easily see their thermal fluctuations. And Laura, what she's doing, she's using two different uh, uh, phospholipids and studying phase separation of the phospholipids on the surface. This is like modeling rafts, vesicle rafts on, on cells. So I wanted to put one other thing in. I'm going to just change topics slightly because this is the nanocenter, and I, so far I really haven't talked about nanometer structures at all. But I want to show you that in fact there is one way of making very interesting nanometer structures using these things. And that's to do something that you really shouldn't do with microfluidics. If you want to make nanometer, nanoparticles, one way of doing it is you can buy a spray dryer. This is the nano buchy. This is a, a, a Swiss commercial spray dryer that's supposed to make nanometer sized particles. But if you look at them, they're really not nanometer sized. They're really uh, several microns in diameter. All it does is it evaporates something and it makes drops, it heats the, uh, the fluid, evaporates the fluid, and whatever is left inside becomes a solid particle. So we uh, decided to do this with, um, with microfluidics and Esther Armstead designed a device which she calls a nebulator. I don't have time. We understand all the hydrodynamics of this. I just don't have time to tell you how it works. It's a fairly complicated device, but instead of using a second fluid, we use air. So we make a spray dryer out of microfluidics. These are made with the more traditional kind of microfluidics, not with the capillary tubes. I'll come back to how we do that in a minute. But here's an example. What she does is with understanding the hydrodynamics, she can make a drop here. This is air, so these are drops in air. And then she uh, has additional flows of air, and this makes very, very, very small drops. And as a result, you form nanometer particles. This bar, you can't see it, but this bar is 500 nanometers. These are the particles you make because you're making tiny, tiny drops, and all that's left are the material inside of the drop. This, we did this actually to, uh, to, to look at uh, primarily uh, hydrophobic drugs. The motivation for that, if you have drugs that don't dissolve very well and you want to get them to dissolve so that they're available to the body to use, you increase their surface area. And one way to increase their surface area is to make them in nanometer scale particles. So you can do it with all these different drugs, but you could also do it with inorganic particles as well. But what's really interesting about this is that if you make them small enough, even though they want to crystallize, they don't. They be, they're amorphous. They remain amorphous. So this is a very, very simple way to make amorphous particles. And you can see this by doing DSC. You can see this by looking at lattice imaging with the EM. They're amorphous particles. Why is that? The reason is really very simple. Basically, you have a drop that's so small that it's evaporating so rapidly, you simply don't have the time to create a nucleus that will form a crystal. It evaporates too rapidly. So you have not insufficient time to nucleate a crystal. And you can do some simple calculations that's shown here. These are the number of crystal nuclei that form as a function of time, as a function of evaporation. And you see that this is the amorphous, to form an amorphous material, you need a much higher concentration, so it happens much more slowly. But you can see that if the drop is uh, small enough, the, um, eventually the, uh, the amorphous, the likelihood of forming an amorphous material happens before you get the formation of a uh, crystal nucleus. It only happens if it's very small. <clears throat> What's even more interesting is that if they're so small, the fact that they're amorphous makes them stable. They don't crystallize. They're too small to crystallize. So here are some drug particles that, look, this is looking now with x-ray, you see that they're uh, crystalline. Um, but over the course, well, these were um, three months. I think now it's uh, six or eight months. They remain amorphous. Why this is important is that an amorphous, if you have a crystal, an amorphous material, an amorphous material is much more soluble. It can be a factor of 20, even 100 more soluble than a crystal. So you'd much rather have an amorphous material. But this is a way of trivially making any material into an amorphous nanoparticle. In fact, we tried to think, what is the thing that's most, that you know always is crystalline? Well, one thing is, see, is this 
Yeah, one thing, well, here are a bunch of different uh, solids, but one thing is salt. Well, you can make an amorphous salt material, an amorphous nanoparticle of salt. Salt always wants to be crystalline, but if you make it small enough, this is about five nanometers, if you make it small enough, it too is an amorphous material. So this is a way of making amorphous nanoparticles of anything just by making them small enough. And you do this because you can control the flow, in this case of a gas, to make very small drops. Okay, I tried to show you, I'm not going to talk more about this, but th there, there are interesting applications for this and interesting uh, um, parallel discussion. I just wanted to show that in, to, to put that in to show a new way of making amorphous, amorphous materials using microfluidics. Let me go back and try and tell you, look, I showed you you can make interesting materials, but now if you really want to make something useful, you have to scale it up. So my little story is this, I told you Anderson can make one of these devices in half an hour. So I said, Anderson, you know, we really ought to see how reproducible can we make them. Make me two devices and let's test them and see if we get the same materials. Hi, nice, that, that's a good idea. So he went back an hour later, half an hour, two devices, came back with two devices, we tested them. They were perfect. He's really good. They, you couldn't tell the difference. One, they made exactly the same. I said, well, that's good, but you know, let's have a real test. Make ten. So he looked at me, mm, okay, a day later, five hours, you know, half hour each for ten, came back, ten devices, and again we tested it, and they really were perfect. You couldn't tell the difference. I said, well, that's great. Now we want to make some useful amount of materials. I need 10,000 devices. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he turned around and walked out of his office, out of my office, and he graduated. He had better things to do. <laughs> Why would you make them? You can't do it that way. You can't scale these things up because you're making them one at a time. So what you have to do is you have to go to the parallel, parallelization scheme of using traditional microfluidics. If you're at Harvard, you go across the street, you ask George Whitesides, please show me how to do soft lithography. There you're stamping devices. So if you want to make two devices, you have a mask that makes the device. You design your mask and you want to make two, you do copy-paste. And you have two devices. Copy-paste, copy-paste, you have four devices. Copy-paste, copy-paste, they have eight devices. Well, you see, scaling up becomes easier. So can we do it with these more stamped devices? So here's a device made in the traditional fashion using soft lithography and PDMS to make double emulsions. And you can see just by controlling the flow rate, this is the same thing that Liang Yin made, by controlling the flow rate you can control the number of drops. And you can easily stack these to make three uh, triple emulsions, if you want to see them a blow up you can see there's really three uh, devices. And in fact Adam Abate who was doing these says, well look Liang Yin already made triple emulsions, I've got to do something a little bit better. So he made quintuple emulsions, drops inside of drops inside of drops inside of drops. You just stack the drop makers. What's interesting is that the triggering is automatic. There's some interesting physics there that it always perfectly triggers. You always get the drops inside of drops. And so you get these multiple emulsions very easily. But you don't want to stack this way. You want to stack in a parallel fashion. And so we've done a lot of work on this. I'll just show you the most recent uh, device. This is a device that Esther made that she calls a millipede device. This device has a central channel and very carefully designed, I don't have time to tell you about it, but I can ha I'm happy to tell you about it afterwards, very carefully designed uh, channels on the side, in this case a thousand different channels on either side. That's why she calls it a millipede device. And this is what it looks like. This is just w lo looking down, down the thousand channels. And look, now we're starting to collect a reasonable amount of material. And we understand the physics of what's causing it, and these can be made absolutely uniform. You can change the size. You, you have to, turns out you have to change the shape of the, the orifice to change the size, but you can control in a very fashion, very, very uh, simple way. But now you put some numbers in. So the highest flow rate, this is, a, this is a not quite up to date. She's a little bit faster than this now, but the highest flow rate she's achieved is 25 milliliters per hour of the internal phase. And the size of the device is four by one by a half centimeter. So now I ask you to give me a liter of volume. That's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And let me fill it with these devices. I can connect them all together with uh, two pumps. So I fill it, uh, the devices and I can get 400 liters. And so in one liter, 
I can now process 10 liters of material in an hour. So this geometry is 10 liters an hour. Let me fill the room, which is the scale that you talk about if you really want to do massive production. Let me fill the room with these devices. You can see now I can start making them in large enough quantities to be useful. In fact, we recognize the fact that this is not unreasonable. Making things drop at a time is not unreasonable. And so we thought, well, we ought to try and commercialize something. And well, there's a historic reason, but if you want to think about, if you want to commercialize, it's still something pretty valuable. What's the most valuable material that you can imagine that you want to commercialize? Obviously drugs. The problem with that is to, to get a drug to market takes seven years. You want to do something a little faster, what's the next most valuable material? Anybody know? It's cosmetics. Women will pay a lot for cosmetics. So here is a product that's marketed by a company, the largest cosmetics company in Korea, Mori Pacific, that uses, that uses these structures made with microfluidics, made by this small startup company, which of course, since it's uh, selling cosmetics, is based in France. Um, in fact, They've taken it quite a bit farther. They've taken the concept of making things drop by drop, uh, making uh, and not being afraid to do it, to make a whole range of different products. Uh, this is a um, uh, machine in their factory that actually uh, makes larger scale drops on a commercial scale. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, uh, image of it that was on the cover of CNA News. And if you go and look, for those of you who know something about uh, cosmetics, I'm starting to learn not because I use them, but because we started this company. A company called La Prairie, a Swiss company, markets something, it's called skin caviar, and this material is made by Capsum. I would like to show you a sample of this. This is the web page. If I show you the next page of the web page, you'll understand why I didn't bring a sample. It's $500 just for one little, uh, 50 milliliter container. I told you there's a high value added in cosmetics. Okay, I've showed you that you can make interesting materials. I've showed you you can scale it up. Let me spend just a few minutes showing you the other side of what you can do. That is the lab on a chip application. But the lab on a chip application of using a drop, a drop to encapsulate things. And so, the reason that this is important or interesting is that the drop will separate the fluidic control, the control of the, of the flow of the drop, with the walls. The uh, reagents are inside the drop. They never touch the walls. You never have to wash the walls. You never have to change the tip of your pipette. You never have to wash anything. Everything is self-contained in the drop. Um, why is it interesting? It's not interesting because of that. It's interesting because of the scale. So here's a simple calculation. It's a physics calculation, physicist's calculation. It's a back of the envelope calculation. Imagine that robot I showed you. Imagine it trying to do some large scale screen. I'm going to give you an example of a large scale screen, which is back of the envelope calculation, but it's really a legitimate calculation. It's not, a, uh, a not um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very typical thing. Why would you screen? Well, drug companies will create a library of drugs. Every time they make a drug, they don't throw it out if it doesn't work. They keep it in a library and they keep it in a freezer. They have literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of drugs. And if there's something new, one way of testing, can they do something, is just test all the drugs against some new biomarker. So they might have 100,000 compounds. They just want to measure an absorption. Does, does, does a binding constant, does a drug bind to the new biomarker? So they might want to do 10 concentrations of each of these things. So you would have a million reactions. This is not uncommon in a large uh, high throughput screening lab. But if you do a current reasonably uh, modern uh, screening device, you might do 10 microliters per reaction. If you do a million reactions, you've just used 10 liters of reagent. And if you go to any high throughput screening lab, that's the rate limiting thing, the cost of the reagent. If you're using very expensive reagents, 10 liters is a lot of material. Um, I once calculated if I do this three times, three reactions, I do that eight times, do a few seconds, one. You gotta run this, if you wanna do a million reactions, you gotta run this for four months, 24 seven. 
And you better hope that your robot doesn't break during that time. Compare what you would do if you used drops. The important thing is, the important quantity to realize is that the volume of a drop that I've showed you, a 10 micron diameter drop, the volume of one of those drops is one picoliter, 10 to the minus 12 liters. So if I want to do a million reactions with a picoliter per reaction, I've used a microliter to do the whole screen. A microliter rather than 10 liters. That's seven orders of magnitude less. And I'm doing them at a thousand per second, so I can do a thousand of them, I can do a million of them in about 20 minutes. We can go have a coffee, come back, and we're done. If we want to do that, we have to now manipulate the drops to do all the things that the robot does. We should be able to make, fill, all the different things that you can do. And let me just show you, I won't go through all the details, but let me show you the type of things that we can do with drops using this control with, uh, made with these more traditional devices, the PDMS devices. We can make drops, there's a variety of ways of making drops, here's one of them. Uh, we can split drops, if we want to do two assays, we can split them in two. We don't have to split them in two, we can, uh, in two uniform, we can split them in two different size drops. We can split them many times, here we're splitting them uh, six times, we're taking large drops, making them into much smaller drops. We can merge drops, this turns out to be a rather difficult thing, you have to do something to uh, um, break the interface because lubrication forces prevent them from breaking. Uh, particularly if you stabilize them with surfactant. So here these drops are charged and they merge nicely. Here we use uh, the fact that, the, that we're using drops of, well, typically the important uh, uh, reagent will be water-based. So it'll be water drops in oil. Water has a very high dielectric constant, oil very low. If you put an electric field, you induce a dipole uh, in the water. If you have pairs of drops like this, the dipole forces cause an, an attraction, and they come close to these electrodes, and they coalesce. You can, de uh, oh, this is another way that we've uh, developed to, uh, to, make, to um, uh, add things to drops. This is what we call a pico injector. Each drop comes along, and a small amount of fluid is injected because we break the uh, interface between the drop with a small uh, electric field applied by these uh, electrodes. So we're injecting a small amount of fluid in each drop. We can detect these. This is, you, you use optical detection. This is done in chips that are uh, transparent, so it's very easy to, to use any kind of laser or optical detection. And the most sophisticated thing, the thing that you have to do is you have to be able to sort the drops, because if you do a screen, you want to be able to pull out those drops that you want. And so here's our, uh, one of our more sophisticated devices. You can see in this case we have two different colors of drops. We have a detector here with a laser, and we have electrodes here, and we turn the field on, and in this case we have to put a gradient field, because we have to put an electric field to induce a dipole, and a gradient of electric field to cause a force on the dipole, and we pull the drops off. In this case we're pulling the clear drops and letting the colored drops go through the top, uh, through the waste, and we can sort these things again at thousands per second. Uh, so what can you do with this? Let me give you just a couple of very quick examples why this is interesting. Here's an enzyme. This is um, horseradish peroxidase. This enzyme is very widely used as a reporter enzyme for biological reactions. It's, it's used because it acts on uh, this substrate and it makes it fluoresce. And nature has made this really well. So we ask the simple question, can we improve on nature? And the way you do that is not to try and do chemistry on the enzyme directly, but rather to use the fact that there's a gene that codes for the enzyme and do what nature does, evolve it. So Jeremy did what's called directed evolution. Basically, he took the parent gene for the enzyme and he made a library of mutated genes. You can do this a number of ways, but you make a library of mutated genes. Then you have to translate that gene into the enzyme. And we worked with a group at MIT. They take the gene, they put them into a plasmid, puts a plasmid into a yeast cell and tricks the yeast cell to display the enzyme on the surface of the yeast cell. So here are yeast inside drops with the parent gene, and the substrate's been added. Wherever there's a yeast cell, you can see the drop becomes fluorescent. So now here's the experiment. We take a library of mutated genes, 
We put, one, put them into plasmid, one plasmid per yeast cell, one yeast cell per drop, add the substrate, wait a little while, see if it fluoresces. If it fluoresces, we sort this. And the nice thing is, because it's yeast, you can break the emulsion, grow them up, grow the yeast up, and do a second round of sorting, or a third round of sorting, to improve the efficiency of the sorting. Most of the yeast will be, have a mutated gene that won't work. We won't see any fluorescence. So we do the experiment. This is what we see. This is the parent type. This is the average fluorescence. If we look at the average fluorescence of the mutated genes, you see a very low fluorescence because most of them are no good. They don't work. A few do, and we sort them. And after a couple of rounds of sorting, we get something a little bit larger. We can sequence this. We can see that we have a bunch of uh, genes that produce enzymes that work almost or just a little bit better. But we have now a whole library of things. We take these and we do, well, we can sequence, we know where the mutations are, but we do a second round of, uh, of mutation. And now we get things that work 20 times as well. In fact, you might say, why not better? Well, 20 times as well, you're already diffusion limited. You cannot measure something that works better. So here you've really improved it. So what have we done? This is a fitness landscape. For those of you who are physicists like me, this is the inverse of an energy landscape. Something that's fit is at the peak. The enzyme is very fit, but now we're asking, please will you become fitter by going to a higher peak? And by doing mutations, this is a mutation space, most of the time you get something that doesn't work as well. So what we did was, rather than jumping from here to here, we did what's called a neutral selection. We did a whole bunch of mutations that work roughly as well, but are mutated, are different. And then we did a second round of mutation. And then we immediately found something that better. This is something that you could, was predicted theoretically, but you could never screen enough to do this. The number, the important number, is that we screened a library of 10 to the 7, and we found about 100, or 1 in 10 to the 5, mutated enzymes that worked roughly as well. In the past, the only way you could do this, you could, uh, a graduate student lifetime, you could screen about 1,000. You never find anything like that, so you could never do this experiment. In fact, you could do this experiment with a robot. Here's why you wouldn't. If you did it with a robot, you'd use 5,000 liters of reagent to do the screening. We used about 150 microliters. It would take you about two years to do the screening. Total screening time was seven hours. It would cost about $16 million to do it. It's mainly the cost of the tips and the cost of reagents. In our case, it cost $2.50, and we tried to amortize it fairly. In fact, I showed this to my colleague, David Nelson. He's a theorist. He said, that's wonderful. The most impressive thing, he said, is that you don't pay your graduate students very much because they work for seven hours, and I only earn $2.50. <laughs> so I assured him that, um, that um, the, cost of, uh, the cost of labor was not included. Well, I could go on with a lot of other applications, but I think I'm running out of time. So let me just jump to the conclusions um, and tell you that what I tried to do was show you the sort of beauty of the things that you can do with microfluidics. Both make new materials, make them in reasonable quantities, and start to use this as a kind of uh, uh, technological uh, screening technique. I showed you one application. We now work on maybe half a dozen or, or a dozen different types of applications in the group uh, trying to do basically take the, take the fact that right now in biology there's so much potential with genomic information where you really need huge amounts of information. This matches the ability of doing these high throughput uh, experiments uh, very well with our um, microfluidic device. So with that, let me thank you and take any questions. Wise about this fascinating talk. I have to tell you that it's a great honor for us to get a Dr. Weiss here. He has a group of 80 people. You can imagine, my group is less than 10. I'm running crazily busy, and I don't know how he's running. We still have the reception, but before that, uh, we can still take uh, several questions. And the reception is from for 30 now until 5.30. You still have chances to ask the questions. So now open to the floor for a few questions. Okay, yeah, Chris. Yeah. Okay, so I was uh, hoping you'd show some slides about your work with prep, uh, microdroppers. It was very elegant work. Uh, this was, I can see you had a challenge 
figuring out what you were going to talk about. Did you, uh, can you comment on any glitches you came up with uh, as you tried to do something so fancy in a tiny little space that was under quite a bit of agitation? Um, so, what I show you are all the successes. <laughs> And the successes are all built on many more failures. So what I think I've learned, particularly with these biological assays, is the translation of anything that can be done in bulk to doing it in drop is non-trivial. Uh, so it's very, very difficult. Um, once it works, it works spectacularly well. Um, any kind of optical, delicate optical technique you might think would be very difficult. It turns out it's very easy. And the reason is that um, typically you have a certain amount of signal that's given by the number of molecules or something that creates some number that creates the signal. When you make a measurement, you're always interested in the signal to background, the signal to noise ratio. The thing that a drop does is it doesn't decrease or change the number of signal molecules. It changes the background by reducing the size of the volume of what can contribute to background. So in fact, the signal stays the same. The background goes way down. So the signal to noise goes way up. So it's actually much easier to detect things of all kinds uh, when you do it in drops. The optics are easier the, uh, the, than, than they are in many other drop-based technologies because it's, you can crush the surface, you can flatten the surface. So it actually becomes fairly easy once you can get the biology to work in the drop. Any other questions? Can you actually like uh, fabricate these things like for uh, any kind of applications, like for example like uh, high pressure, high temperature reactions? <coughs> um, yeah, so so, yeah, I mean, we have not tried to go to um, more rigid materials like stainless steel and things like that. I don't see any reason why you can't. Um, I would, now, these days, what we're trying to do is set up to do uh, 3D printing of these things. So we'll do them with plastic. We'll be a little bit more robust. Um, so I think you can. We haven't really tried to focus on it, but I don't see anything that would prevent you from working at somewhat higher pressures and um, uh, certainly high temperatures. We've done things where we go up to 50 degrees, 60 degrees, nothing really high, but I don't see any reason that you couldn't do something like that. It's just a materials problem. Is that the droplet, if you like say as a mixture of the droplet that you can have it, is that selective so you can control like this droplet for the encapsulation? Is that selective and also is that the time between every re like for releasing is can be controllable? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by selective. Um, uh, when you have a mixture of droplets inside of, the, I am thinking about the biological aspect of this. Is that the droplet, when you have encapsulation, do you have the selective so you can select, or when it's released, it's a start to release the whole? So the answer is um, you can, but you're limited to your own imagination. You can do just about anything you want because you have tremendous control of the way you mix the fluids. You, you can. Anything you can imagine doing, you can probably find a way of doing. The problem is you have to imagine what it is that you want to do and have to come up with the right chemistries, say, to, to, to provide the control release. We certainly have a lot of different types of uh, ways that we can, say, put drops inside of larger drops and control when we merge the two smaller drops together. Uh, when we release what's inside to the drops, when we release the outside, we uh, explore a lot of different potential routes to doing that. Um, it's just more a matter of Im imagining what it is you really want to do and figuring out how to do that. I'm not sure if I understood that because I'm thinking about the drop as a droplet. 
when you have, can, like, is that controllable about which one first is releasing and the time of release? At it's as controllable as any other technology for encapsulating drugs. The, the difference here is that you can do this with um, higher efficiency for the encapsulation and with a greater degree of control over the polymers that you use. So you're not limited just to the standard PLA or PGA, uh, PGA, uh, PGLA. Uh, you can do a variety of different things, a variety of different structures. Uh, you can make a lot of different structures with relative ease. Thank you. Okay, we can take one or two more questions. Do you have any questions? No. Oh, 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 lady. Uh, I'm wondering what is the duty cycle of like these chips? Like they are, they work great when they work, and like tomorrow you come back and they just don't. Like, all the numbers, like high uh, volume rate, the, the, like the rate that you can create all those droplets, th those numbers are great. So okay, so I mean that's a really good question, and I would argue the following: that um, microfluidics as a field started 20 or 30 years ago. The first chips were all done in silicon, and then in silica or glass. The duty cycle of when you design a chip to when you make a chip with that is typically a month. We find that the big problem is getting the flows right, that we don't do calculations, we don't try and simulate, we just do experiments. With soft lithography, I say we can, from the idea to the chip, is two days. And I always worry, just trying to run a lab, why is it, why is it two days, not one day? And the reason it's two days is that to the process of making them, you need a mask that you expose the master to make the pattern that you can stamp into the chip. That mask, the way we make it is we print it. But we need a high resolution printer. And we found a company in Colorado that has a high resolution printer. So if we want a, a mask, we uh, design it on a CAD program, we email them the pattern, and they ship it to us by FedEx the next day. So that's the, that's the extra day. Otherwise, it's a day to make a device. And that's why progress is so rapid, is that um, the, you can try things very rapidly. And typically, you'll make uh, eight or 10 devices on a chip. So it's really very fast, and it's very easy to, to make progress in that sense. The other thing you ask is how long the, the chips last. Um, if you, if you the, the PDMS, which is the standard material, is really a lousy material because it swells with anything inside. We, most of what we use in PDMS is fluorinated oil, which is nice because it doesn't swell the PDMS. If it does swell the PDMS, you have to either go to a different material. Going to a different material will take away the ease of fabrication, or you have to somehow coat the walls of the PDMS with something that prevents swelling. And so we've learned a lot of tricks about how to coat the walls to prevent that. So I would say that now we can make devices in a couple of days, which is a very high turnaround rate, and we can use them for fairly extended periods if we want. Like, can I ask, like, do you have an estimate, like, how, like, what, what the extended use is, like, a few days, a few hours, or? Well, it depends on the application. For some of these screening applications, we can use them, you know, days without any problem. For the production of materials, if we can use materials that don't swell the devices, we can, I mean, you can saw that Capsum does it commercially. So it produces, you know, it can run for, for, for days. Um, we certainly can run it for a day easily. With our coding technology, we can make them run, again, we get tired of making things typically before we start. We run into problems. Apart from the swelling part, um, PDMS is well. Anything would absorb on the surface, like any body markers, like anything. That Absolutely, it's terrible. Yeah, exactly. So, why do you think we went to drops? That's the that's the beauty of drops. The drops never touch the surface because we coat the surface to make it very hydrophobic, so that the water stays away from it. It's always a layer of oil between the, um, the reagents and the, and the surface, so you never have to clean it. You have to get the, the 
inner interface of the drops coated. So there's two years of work to develop a good surfactant, but once you have that, then you, you never have to worry about the, and, and that's exactly why you have to worry about it. There are instances where you can't coat everything, where you do have to bring, uh, where, you, where you load the, the reagents, and then you, you, you absolutely run into problems because it's, uh, PDMS is such a miserable surface. So we, you, so you make a polymer though. So you, I assume your polymer in the organic solvent is bring in. So, so do you have some study to see what kind of polymer is required for this? Because I'm just thinking about why it's so stable and why it can make rise or make this emulsion stabilize so quickly by two phase. Okay, so. Um, you're asking two different things. You're asking something that what can you make them with and what, what's really stable. I, I see that some trick you choose the polymer block polymer. Right. So if we use polymerosomes, it's really nice to get them sticky. So you want to, to have them slightly sticky. And we have tricks uh, of making them. We put them into a mixture of a good solvent and a bad solvent. The good solvent is more volatile, evaporates fast, uh, faster, then the bad solvent remains and they come out and they stick in the bad solvent. So, so you use the common solvent? In yeah. This process. Yeah. But if we go to these very thin shells, then everything becomes a much more mechanically stable. We don't have to worry about anything like that. Okay, we're going to stop here and go to the reception. Thanks, everybody.